Sir Justin St. Clair. We, we were supposed to do this interview last year, but there were some, there were some scheduling issues and Justin couldn't be here. So I'm really happy that we're able to do it now. So we'll start right at the beginning like I do with all my other guests. Tell us a little bit about your, your early life and your growing up. Good. <laughs> oh, you've got quite an audience here. Yeah, I'm sure of so growing up apparently hasn't happened. Um, <laughs> ask my buddies. Nope. Um, I was actually born in a really small farming community uh, in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. Uh, there were like 1,998 Republicans, a black guy and me. Um, one night the black guy disappeared, I left. Um, and, and that's pretty much my, you know, the earliest. Um, very much, you know, in the closet, small town, uh, no one accepted it. Uh, despite being completely in the closet, uh, managed to find a high school sweetheart uh, in a high school with 200 people, nonetheless. Um, at some point, um, I embraced religion because I didn't want to be gay. Um, later in life, discovered that I liked being gay more than I liked religion. <laughs> More immediate benefits. <laughs> what, what branch of religion did you embrace at that point? Um, independent Baptist. If, if you're oh, going to embrace something, yeah. embrace it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like go big or go home, right? And I mean, I mean the the ladies don't cut their hair. They don't wear yeah, exactly. They they um, don't wear pants. You don't listen to anything secular. You don't watch TV. You pretty much sit there and grow cobwebs on your ass and die. <laughs> And what about that? Why, why that of all things? Um, I, I, think, I think that there were two things. Um, one was I, didn't, I really didn't want to be gay. I didn't, I didn't even really fully accept that I was. And it was a way to cover it and hide it and, and all of that. The other is I am incredibly socially awkward and um, did not grow up popular. I, I was the one stuffed in lockers and and um, made fun of and all of that. And there was a camaraderie there. Um, something about evangelicalism that they draw their own in and it feels like a family. But coming from that small town in a, in a very myopic environment, what concept did you even have about being gay? Um, you're talking the 1980s, so my concept of being gay was probably the very limited TV coverage, which was New York City Gay Parade, which was, oh my God, um, and the AIDS crisis. Um, you know, despite the fact that I had a boyfriend that I slept with for 16 years, I still didn't fully admit that I was gay. And I know that sounds stupid, but it, it was truly, oh, we're just doing this until, you know, well, until I find the right person. They're going to come along, this high school, college, graduate school. <laughs> it will go away eventually. It doesn't. <laughs> but you just alluded to academics. You're very academically accomplished. Tell us about that. Um, so, having embraced religion, I actually um, went out, uh, got a bachelor's and a master's in theology, uh, and then a doctorate uh, in actually educational counseling. Um, wanted to be a uh, Christian school counselor because that would have ended well. Wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and so I did that, and then when I realized that that wasn't what I was going to do, AKA got thrown out of the church and everything else when I came out, I uh, went back and got my master's in healthcare administration uh, and my PhD in healthcare finance. Wow, wow, wow. And then there are the mere mortals among us. You know? But let's take a step back. Tell us about coming out and being thrown out of the church. Tell us all about that process and part of your life. Sure. So um, my partner Michael, uh, we we have been best friends since I was in uh, seventh grade, and we discovered each other sexually at 
16 or 17, I don't know, when, when you realize that things happen when you do things. Um, <laughs> and so we did a lot of things. <laughs> What things did you do? Yes. <laughs> um, and, um, and so Mike and I were together in the closet. Mike was actually came out of the closet as gay. Um, and I was the one in the church that everyone was like, oh, what a good little Christian. He's being a little witness, helping him. Um, yeah, uh, a lot. Um, and then, uh, when I was when I was 30, actually 31, uh, Mike was killed in a car accident, oh. and um, he was uh, killed on December 29th of 2000. And within the next month, I really took a look at my life and said, "Do I really want to spend the next 30 years of my life not embracing what it is that will really make me happy?" Um, and so I, you know marched into my mother and said, Mom, we need to have a talk. And she looks at me and she's just like, what, you've got a girlfriend? And I'm like, no. And she goes, oh, so you have a boyfriend. Wow. And I just looked at her and I'm like, how do you know? And she's like, like I didn't know when you were 12. <laughs> so, um, went well, part, not, not everybody re responded so well. Um, family members that had still never spoken to me again. Uh, the church didn't really handle it um, well. Um, they, um, uh, I actually asked to have my name removed from membership and said this isn't going to happen. Um, they weren't content with that, of course. So they brought it up for the entire congregation to vote me out of membership and uh, then called the seminary that I went to to try to dig up uh, all of these Bones. <laughs> Poor word choice. Um, <laughs> skeletons. <laughs> That's a lot of bones. <laughs> I just can't let that go. I'm sorry. Um, and of course, there weren't any because um, the weirdest thing about Justin St. Clair until he was 31 years old is that uh, Michael and I were monogamous for 16 years. Wow. That's beautiful. It's a little boring, but you know, it's, it's <laughs> God rest his soul. <laughs> Tell us about coming into the leather community. Tell us about that journey. So, um, leather community was a little bit of an accident, I think. Um, <laughs> Sky, Sky was there when I was, <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> so I, after I came out to my family, I'm like, so now I need to go do gay things. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? I, and except I don't know what that means. So I literally picked up everything <clears throat> and I moved to Boys Town in Chicago, right in the middle of Halstead, and said, I am here because this is what gay people do. Wow. And I'm in my, you know, I'm in my four-wheel drive Chevy three-quarter ton pickup truck, and my flannel, and my jeans, and my cap, and um, I didn't really fit in well on Halstead Street in Chicago. Uh, try as I might, I I still don't understand what I'm. And so I, I was actually really depressed after uh, about six months of thinking that after I'd come out and, and had had a lot of heartache, a lot of my family not accepting and, and friends and you know the, the church that had felt like family, I think my expectation was that all gay people would get along. Uh, <laughs> That because right, that, that because we had all felt this you know form of oppression and and we'd all gone through this that at some point that because you've gone through that you have a camaraderie and so there's just part of me that just thought that we would move there and I don't know watch Wizard of Oz every night <laughs> maybe Golden Girls I I don't know. Um, and I was shocked that if you didn't have the right hair and the right clothes and hang out with the right people and all of those things, that you were 
I was probably no more accepted than I was out in the straight world. Uh, and consider just giving up and moving back and you know, getting a subscription to some magazine other than National Geographic. <laughs> um, and then one night I wandered of all places um, into the manhole. <laughs> um, it, it, no, no euphemism. The bar was actually a man, the manhole. Um, and I got to talk to the, the bartender. We were having a good time, and he was like, "You know, we're looking for a doorman. Do you want to, you know, make a few bucks?" And I'm like, "Sure, yeah, exactly." So um, at that point, I, you know, the manhole was leather and Levi's, um, and really sort of was feeling good. And then one night, one of my coworkers said, come on, we're going to go to the cell block. And I'm like, that sounds terrifying. What's the cell block? And they're like, oh, it's just like the manhole, except there's a motorcycle. Um, so I, I went into cell block and couldn't get into the back because I didn't own anything. Um, so the guy that was working the door loaned me his vest and made me take off my tennis shoes. Um, and the only thing more terrifying than the cell block is being without shoes at this point. Um, find the line, find the line. So I go into the back and I am like terrified. I'm like hanging on to this man for dear life. You know? um, and I look over there and I'm just like, I, I grab him and I'm like, that man has his arm inside that other man. <laughs> and, um, and his name was Matt. Uh, um, I met my friend. And Matt turns to me and looks over and says, give it five minutes, the other word will be in there too. <laughs> um, I was terrified, um, intrigued, erect. Uh, there were a lot of different things I was feeling. And um, one of the things that happened within days of that was I discovered that I, when I walked into a leather bar, nobody cared what my hair looked like. And nobody cared. Well, I had hair then, okay. Um, nobody, all of those things that I wasn't finding in the gay community, I was finding in the leather community. There was not the judgment. There was not all of those things. It was just, come on in. You know, later it was like, get rid of the fucking Paisley shirt. But, <laughs> you know, but at the time, it, it was accept now and then teach, rather than fucking be what we want you to be and yeah. then we'll accept you. It was, the, it was the opposite of what I had found and exactly what I needed in life. Well, wow, that's a strong statement. Wow. Well, tell us about discovering the puppy community. How did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking puppies. <laughs> so uh, I competed in IML 2007. Seven, 2007. Um, uh, top 20. Woo. Uh, last Mr. Mephisto leather ever. Yes, sir. Um, I did such a horrible job they stopped the contest. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, and there I met this guy, um, became my boy, uh, loved this guy, he was just amazing. Uh, and then one night he barked at me. <laughs> As happens. And I'm like, what the fuck do you do with a boy that barks? <laughs> I mean, and he's like, I'm a puppy. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> And so he, you know, we started talking about it and, and actually started showing me some things. The internet existed by then, it was amazing. Um, and I just sort of said, that's great for you. Um, I'm glad you want to do that. Um, no, no, just not for me. Uh, and two things probably led me headlong into the community. One was that as I looked for someone to mentor him, I couldn't find anybody. And I looked around at Chicago, which is realistically one of the leather meccas of the country, um, and there should be people there who can mentor anything. And I couldn't find it. And that bothered me. Wow. So I started um, 
buying bio dog books and said, I'll figure out how to train him just like I would a bio dog figure it would appease him. And then really what happened was one day I was watching Doctor Who, <laughs> as one does. And, um, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, when I, in my free time, I restore uh, old Victorian homes. And I was, at the time, had just restored like a 6,000 square foot home wow. that we were living in. And he wanted to play, and I wanted to watch Doctor Who because that's <laughs> what we do. And um, the, the TV room was on the second floor, so he wanted to play. So I picked up his ball and I threw it out the door, door of the banister. And it would go down the spiral stairs out into the living room at 6,000 square feet. It would take him 20 minutes to find the fucking ball. <laughs> And in the meantime, I could get through, you know, a, a good part of the episode. And he would bring it back, and I'd throw it over again. And about the third time, he had just had enough of that shit. <laughs> and he tackled me. Now, I'm on, the, I'm on the couch laying back, and he tackles me. Now, at the time, I am, I am Sir Justin, you asshole. <laughs> You do not tackle, sir. You, you, and, and it's like scolding a bio puppy. It's like, then they get so fucking cute about it. And so I'm like, asshole, and I tackled him back. And then he rolled over, and I rolled over, and this ridiculous scene from The Lion King hit me again. Um, and, yeah, exactly, exactly. And what happened was I discovered that there is a handler headspace. Mm -hmm. That all of a sudden I found a new version of me that was not just Sir Justin, disciplinary and off, you know, the authority, all of that. That, that there was this, um, nurturing in a different way. Felt like a biological little boy playing with a puppy, you know, in the backyard when you're five years old. And when that happened, it it was instant. I, wow. I would never be able to not have a puppy again. Not saying I might not have a boy too, if anyone's <laughs> looking, um, room 248. Um, <laughs> Always working. Yes. Collector. And Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If you can, gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. And and so I might have boys, but I couldn't not have a puppy at that point. Wow. Well, what is iPod? Tell us about its meaning, focus, community benefits, all that. All right. So. Um, So before I talk about iPod, um, iPod originated as a weekend concept when IPTC was at Beyond Vanilla. And uh, we wanted a place that was just for puppies at Beyond Vanilla. And then the following year, um, I had become friends with Joe Master Pasqua. And um, it was an unlikely friendship because we were rival organizations. We were all supposed to hate each other. And um, we started talking about the community and what was best for the community. And at, at some point in our discussions, um, the suggestion was made to bring IPC and IPTC together for a weekend. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm um, getting really emotional right now. For those who do not know, um, Joe Master Pasquale passed away this afternoon, or this morning. Um, and, um, and we lost one of the founders of our community. We lost, uh, we lost a man who, um, despite the fact that he and I may have had different philosophies, uh, gave his heart and gave his soul to the puppy community, and we lost a mentor that will never be replaced. Um, so while I normally talk about IPAW with a lot of jovial, I love what we're doing, um, 
there's a little bit of a dark cloud today for us. Understandable. Um, so, but IPAW came about saying, we all love our contests. Um, I'm the executive producer of IPTC, I love contests. But we were looking for a weekend that was not just about a contest. I had been through some amazing weekends where they felt more like there was a great big weekend of people together and a contest just happened to be happening over there on the side. And I said, I want that for puppies. I, I, I freaking want a claw for puppies. I want an IML for puppies. I want something where, where puppies can go and feel a safe space. As, as welcoming as the leather community is, not all puppies are leather. And a lot of puppies don't feel safe and included in all of the leather spaces that those of us who came out of the leather community do. And so our desire was simply, let's do something fun where people can go, they can enjoy themselves, they, they can have 10,000 balls in a ball pit and they can <laughs> run around and there can be an obstacle course, they can sniff each other's ass and they can do all of the things they want to do and really just have fun with it. The fact that the contest is there is awesome, but that's really not the focus of what the weekend is. Okay. Thank you for at least being here when this has been a very difficult day for you and a painful day. I know the audience is appreciative, I am appreciative, and we, we give you our hearts today. Um, I, what I would ask is Joe had a lot of family and a lot of friends that um, were a lot closer than we were. You know, we, we were uh, friends because of uh, events and the things that we did and it had built that friendship. There are a lot of people in our community who are hurting today. Reach out to them. Um, whether it's on Facebook, whether they're here, give them a hug and love them um, because, because we've suffered a great loss. But on a slightly lighter note, thank you, <laughs> to uh, bring things a little high, a little more cheerful, you ran for president of the United States. <laughs> Tell us about that. So, <laughs> story. <laughs> so um, several years ago, not that many years ago, by the way, four years ago or so, um, my state representative, uh, in the middle of his term, chose to retire. And so I threw my name in the hat to be replaced, um, to, to, to be his replacement until the next term. Um, for those of you who missed the beginning, we're going to rewind. Um, my house is in a very conservative district. Um, there are now four Democrats there, you know, um, but it, it's pretty conservative. Uh, but people have gotten to know me, and people have really accepted me in a lot of ways. Now, oh, he's the gay on the corner. He's, he's the one that fixed up that trashy old house and brought our property value up. Um, true story. And so, um, as, as we would talk and, and moving on, I was a finalist to actually become, um, become the representative for our district. The problem was they weren't sure that a ridiculously gay, uh, not Republican, could carry the general election. And the funny thing was, every single person that I interviewed with said, we love you, we think you're perfect, but I don't think anybody else will accept you. <laughs> and by the time I was done, I'm like, fuckers, if, if all of you can accept me, everybody can. Well, we had made a gentleman's agreement that I would not run against whoever they chose in the general election. So instead, I filed my name to run for president of the United States. Um, right? Um, in retrospect, I really should have um, followed that a lot closer. Um, and um, actually uh, got some people behind me, got really serious about it uh, for a little while. And then, um, and then some people just managed to find pictures on Facebook and said, I'm not sure that this is going to fly. <laughs> uh, and, 
and I have a tendency to think they're right. Um, there, are, there, there, there may or may not, Miss Kendra, um, be some pictures of me floating around from GLLA to a couple of years ago. <laughs> you know, um, I rumored. I, I haven't actually seen the photos. Um, yes, I have. Yeah, and, 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 and it was clearly me. And, and we made the decision that the country might not quite be ready for what I would have to offer. <laughs> so 2020, here we go. Yeah. Hey, I say do it. I say go for it. You know, honestly. But what's the, the biggest misconception about you? <sighs> um, honestly, probably the biggest misconception is I have a lot of people approach me, talk to me, and say, you're so aloof and unapproachable. What? Uh, no, I, I get a lot of people that, that were like, oh, I always thought you were sort of arrogant and full of yourself. And, and, uh -huh, asshole. and the truth be known, I'm like this terrified little boy um, who just sits up there and like begs for acceptance and wants everyone to love him and is afraid that somebody doesn't. Um, and, and literally somebody says, uh, I was at an event and you didn't talk to me even though I was at a fucking dog food you'd never know who I was. And, and I'm the one who gets my feelings hurt and goes home and literally cries all tears because I might have hurt somebody's feelings. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. Very much. One, for taking time on a, on a difficult day and for sharing everything with us. And I extend sincere condolences and all of our love to you. Thank you.